Please remain standing as we hear from the Gospel of John, the 13th chapter, these words. Before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his time had come to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them fully. Jesus and his disciples were sharing the evening meal. The the excuse me, the devil had already provoked Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the table and he took off his robes and picking up a linen towel, he tied it around his waist. And then he poured water into a wash bowl and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that he was wearing. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but you will understand later. No, Peter said, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't have a place with me. Simon Peter said, Lord, then not only my feet, but my head also, and my hands. Jesus responded, those who have been bathed need only to have their feet washed because they are completely clean. You disciples are clean, but not every one of you. He knew who would betray him. That's why he said, not every one of you is clean. After he washed the disciples' feet, he put on his robe and returned to his place at the table, and he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you speak correctly because I am. If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you too must wash each other's feet. I have given you an example, just as I have done you also must do. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Some of you may well recognize the name Dr. Tony Campolo. Dr. Campolo is a well-known and highly respected inspirational speaker. And so as an inspirational speaker... He has traveled all around the world in various speaking engagements and has spent so much time traveling that when their children were young, he and his wife Peggy made the decision that Peggy would stay at home and raise their children. She would be that stay-at-home mom taking care of their children, Bart and Lisa. Well, on those rare occasions when Peggy would travel with Tony, She would get into conversations with people that she felt were famous and powerful, sophisticated, and influential in the world, people that Tony hubnubbed around with all the time. But she would feel very awkward around them, and so she confessed to Tony one night that she found herself intimidated by all of these powerful, influential people, and she started questioning her own self-worth as a stay-at-home mom. Tony said, well, honey, why don't you think about a good response that you can give to them when you meet them to let them know how strongly you value what you do and why it is that you have chosen to stay at home to raise our children, how crucial and important that is. Well, not long after that, Tony and Peggy were at a party And Tony overheard Peggy speaking to one of the ladies at the party who asked Peggy this question in what she perceived as a condescending tone. The lady said, well, my dear, what is it that you do? And Tony overheard his wife come back with this reply. 
Well, I happen to be nurturing two homo sapiens into the dominant values of the Judeo-Christian tradition in order that they might become instruments for the transformation of the social order into the kind of eschatological utopia that God has meant from the very beginning of time. And the woman said, oh, well, I'm just a lawyer. Wow, how impressive. Well, I like that story. I like that story because there are a lot of important jobs in this world. But probably the most important job in this world is that job of nurturing and teaching young people. Nurturing and teaching others what it means to follow Christ and to be the hands and feet of Christ at work in the world today in order to bring about God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So today, as we celebrate Mother's Day and the beginning of the Festival of the Christian Home, we are continuing in our sermon series looking at how we know Jesus. And today, I think it's very appropriate for us to remember that Jesus was a great teacher. And as a great teacher, Jesus gives to the example of how we can teach others about who they are and about how we are to live this life that God has given to each one of us. You know, the definition of teacher for many of us is simply a dispenser of information. Someone who gives out rules and gives us dates and facts that we are to remember in our minds and in our hearts. But Jesus as the greatest teacher of them all, helps us to understand that being a teacher is about so much more. Being a teacher is about imparting to others from our heart, embodying what it means to be one who loves God and loves others. Over 40 times in the gospel, we read about people calling Jesus teacher. And yet some people think that when we call Jesus a teacher, we display a weak faith, that we're denying Jesus' divinity. They prefer to think of Jesus as Lord or Savior. And yet, as you heard when we talked about those titles, those titles are not used nearly as often in the Gospels as the title teacher. To Jesus' first disciples, Jesus always was, for them, their rabbi, their teacher, helping them to understand who God created them to be and how they are to live their lives. I'm reminded of what Gandhi said so many years ago. Gandhi said, if the followers of Jesus would follow the teachings of that great teacher, what a different world we would live in. My friends, I want to ask each one of us today to take time to reflect on the teachings of Jesus and to ask ourselves, what teachings of Jesus do we need to recommit ourselves to so that we might help to make other disciples and transform the world into the place that God has called it to be. As I look at Jesus' life as a teacher, I see that far from merely dispensing information to the disciples, Jesus taught them by example, embodying what it means to love others. Jesus noticed the unnoticed people around Jesus didn't just talk about being a peacemaker. He established peace. He reached out to those who were the outcast, inviting Matthew, the tax collector, to be part of his inner circle, having lunch with Zacchaeus, the tax collector, reaching out to those with leprosy that others had pushed to the margins of life and didn't want to speak to. Jesus embodied a way of life. And in the scripture passage that we read today, Jesus knows that he is about 
to go to the cross. He knows that he is in the final hours of his life on earth. And he has these last few moments to impart to his disciples what are the most important things that he wants them to remember. It is interesting to me that what Jesus does as his lasting lesson to his disciples is he takes on the role of a servant. He humbles himself. He gets down on his knees and he washes their dirty, stinking feet. You heard in the scriptures that one of the disciples said, oh no, you're the teacher. You can't be in the role of a servant. Jesus says, I'm giving you an example of how you are to love one another. You are to love one another, not just with your words, but with your deeds. You are to love one another by actively showing love, being willing to be humble and to serve one another. It's in that context that Jesus also shares that statement about being the way, the truth, and the life. And he helps them to understand what that means by washing their feet. He's saying, the way of life that I'm about to follow, the way of dying on a cross out of love, is the way of life that I'm calling you to follow, a way of sacrificial love, a way of loving so much that you're willing to lay down your life for one another. As a teacher, Jesus understood that one of the clearest ways that we learn about God's love and what it means to love other people is by experiencing that love ourselves. And so he wanted to pour out that love upon the disciples that night, help them to feel his love for them so that they might share that love with others. So he says, love one another as I have loved you. I stand before you today as one who is very grateful for the women in my life who have poured that kind of love into my life. And not just women. I told you last week, I am so grateful for this congregation, for the way you have poured out love on me, especially in these last few weeks. Pouring out our love into others, not just speaking love, does something to nurture us and strengthen us and help us to face the challenges of life. I say all of that, and I wanted to remind us of some of the ways that we pour out love into others in this world. One of the women in my life who poured out love to me and to others is a dear woman who now lives in heaven with Jesus. Her name is Mary Louise Mason. She only had one biological child. His name was Jimmy. And Jimmy was born with special needs. Mary Louise told me that when Jimmy was born and the doctors told us that Jimmy would always have difficulty learning, that her hopes and her dreams of watching her only son graduate from high school and college, receive any kind of formal education, were shattered. It was difficult for her to think of her only son never marrying and never having children of his own. And she said it was difficult for her as a mother to teach Jimmy anything. So she said she decided she would just stay with the basics as she raised Jimmy in her home. She told me that she wanted to make sure he knew the most important things in life. No matter how difficult it was for him to learn, she wanted to make sure that he knew what was most important. And anything that he could learn beyond the basics, she said, would be gravy. 
And the basics for Mary Louise included the following. She wanted Jimmy to know God loves you. Love God and love your neighbor. Don't be like Bluto on Popeye. Y'all know who Bluto is, right? You know, I was always picking a fight with somebody, a bully. Don't be a bully. Wear outside clothes if you go outside. Change your underwear every day. Brush your teeth after every meal. Share with others and take turns. Keep your hands to yourself. No smacking and no cussing. Pray the Lord's Prayer and say your prayers every night before you go to sleep. Sing Jesus Loves Me and sing Amazing Grace. And thank God for everything you have. And say a blessing before you eat. Did you notice how many of those basics, basics, were concerned with her teaching Jimmy about God's presence in her life and God's love for her, God's love for him, God's love for all people. The most important lessons that any of us can share with children and with those around us are the lessons of faith. Because you see, God is not satisfied with just changing our final destination from earth to heaven. God wants to make sure that we know how to live in harmony and peace and love with one another here and now. God wants us to be turned into the closest thing to Jesus Christ that we can be on this side of heaven. Christ followers, disciples of Christ, those who look like Christ on this side of heaven. In teaching Jimmy the basics of life, Mary Louise says, because so much of what he learned was just by rote, just those words, remembering them, she wasn't sure how much he really understood. But she smiled whenever he sang, Jesus Loves Me. And she wondered, does he really understand what that song means? We allowed Jimmy to go through the confirmation Process. I say aloud, we had the privilege of Jimmy going through the confirmation process in the church. And the way we did that was we took him into the sanctuary. And the stained glass windows at that church all had scenes from the biblical story of Jesus' life. And we asked Jimmy to tell us about the stories in each one of those window scenes to see if he knew the story of Jesus' life. Jimmy's father said, he knows the stories, but does he know really how loved he is by God and what all of that means? And then one day, Jim and Mary Louise got their answer. Jim took Jimmy to the dentist office, and when he came home, Jimmy greeted his mother, and he said, I went to the dentist today. And Mary Louise said, I know. How did it go? And Jimmy replied, the dentist cleans your teeth. And Mary Louise said, yes. And then Jimmy said, and you know what? God sits beside you in the dentist chair. She said, he spoke those words, so matter of fact, God sits beside you in the dentist chair. He understood that Jesus would never leave him or forsake him, that Jesus loved him and was always with him, no matter how scary life could be, whether it's in a dentist chair or facing any other difficulty in life. One of the clearest ways we learn that God loves us is by experiencing something of God's love through the love of others those who wash our feet, and those who share life with us, like mothers. In one of Reverend Charles Stanley's In Touch newsletters, he tells the following story of a mother's love that touched me so. 
He said a few years ago, a 12-year-old boy named Michael was swimming in a small pond near his family's home in Florida. He was paddling along with a snorkel and a mask on, head under the water. And Michael didn't know that an 11-foot, 400-pound alligator was bearing down upon him. The creature lunged for the boy's head, and its jaws snapped shut, and the mask and the snorkel were torn away. But miraculously, Michael's head came free from the gator's mouth, and he began to swim frantically toward the shore with that hungry alligator right behind him. The boy's cousin, Jill, was standing on the shoreline, and she screamed, and that scream alarmed Michael's mother. She raced to the bank just as her son reached the shore, and then the gator clamped down on Michael's leg. His mother grabbed his hands, and she pulled in a tug of war with that tenacious alligator, clutching Michael's hands with a death grip. His mom pulled with superhuman strength and pulled her son free. Michael's mother, Jen, dragged her son up to the bank to safety. And three months later, Michael showed a friend the scene of that near-fatal attack. By then, almost all of his scars had healed. The gouge on his scalp was covered with hair, and the gashes on his leg had almost healed totally. But proudly, Michael showed off three small scars on the back of his right hand. He told his friends, look at these three. These three didn't come from that gator. These three are marks of love. These three are from my mom grabbing me so hard that she dug her nails into my skin and pulled on me. She drew blood to save her son's life. My friends, evil forces are out there in the world. Difficulties, heartache, and harm is out there. And we are called as followers of Jesus Christ to love each other so much that we are reaching out with love, tenacious love, sacrificial love, just like that, in order to help others know God's love in this world. Now, some of you are like me. You're at the stage in life where our parents are the ones who need our sacrificial love. It's part of that circle of life. Our parents provided for our needs when we were young, but now it's they who have pressing needs of their own who will be there for them. I'm part of that sandwich generation, I guess, still a grandmother, a mother, and a daughter caught between the needs of all the others in my life. And it's a really difficult place to be, you know? But I read a story about a lady named Bev Halzer who tells of a time years ago when her mother came for a visit. Her mother asked Bev to go shopping with her because she needed a new dress. And Bev confesses that she's not a patient person herself, and she didn't look forward to shopping with her elderly mother. But they set off together. They visited nearly every store that carried ladies' dresses in their town, and her mother tried on dress after dress after dress, rejecting them all. And as the day went on, Bev said she grew very weary, and her mother was growing frustrated. Finally, at their last stop, her mother tried on a lovely blue three-piece dress. The blouse had a bow at the neckline. And as Bev stood in the dressing room with her mother, she watched her mother's arthritic hands try to tie that bow. And she just couldn't do it. And so Bev, in her impatience, gave way to an overwhelming sense of compassion for her mom. And she turned away to try to hide her tears 
Regaining her composure, she turned back to her dear mother, and she tied her bow for her, and the dress was beautiful. Her mother bought it. Their shopping trip was over, but that event was etched in Bev's mind forever. For the rest of the day, her mind kept returning to that moment in the dressing room and the vision of her mother trying to tie a bow and not being able to. Those same hands that had fed her when she was a baby. Those same hands that had bathed her and dressed her and caressed her and comforted her and hugged her and prayed for her. She was now touching in the most remarkable way. Later in the evening, Bev went into her mother's room and she took her mother's hands in her own and she kissed them. And then to much her surprise, her mom looked at her and with gentleness touched her face. Bev took her mom's hand again, and she said, Mom, you have the most beautiful hands in the world. Bev says she's so grateful that God let her see with new eyes what a precious and priceless gift of a loving and self-sacrificing mother she had. And she prays that someday her own hands and her heart will have earned such a beauty of their own. Some of you can relate to that story, I'm sure. You've been touched by the loving hands, the sacrificial hands of others in your life, be they mothers or teachers, be they coaches or fathers, fellow church members or friends. You know, Christ never promised us that life on this side of heaven would be easy. But he has promised us that he will give us the strength and the courage to love as he has loved us. And so as we give thanks for the women who have mothered us in this world, let us pray that we too might pass on the kind of love that Christ has for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I